Look down here in chapter 24, in verse number 1. The Bible reads, Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Zibiah Beersheba. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Now, there's a couple of instances where this happens in the Bible where you have like a child becoming a king. And we, we're going to go through a lot of the instances and, and, and the backdrop, the backstory of how this even came to pass, of why this even happened. But, and just a little bit of that is this is referring to the kingdom of Judah. Okay, in the book of Chronicles, you're reading about the kings of Judah. That's, um, that was the more righteous of the two nations when they had split up into Israel and Judah. Um, after, after the reign of King Solomon, when Rehoboam, his son, was, was reigning and ruling, he was unwise. And basically, God decided to divide up the, the kingdom because of the sins of Solomon. Because when he got later on, and he started making all these altars for his wives to their false gods and things like that, that really angered God. And he said, you know what? I'm going to rend the kingdom from you. I'm going, to, I'm going to split it up. I'm going to leave a portion just because of King David's sake. Because David was a righteous man. He was a man after God's own heart. And he says, because of him, because I respect David and I made a promise to David, I'm going to allow you to reign. And that's where the kingdom of Judah was. But the much larger kingdom, which is the vast majority of the tribes of Israel, was split up then and the uh, was given to... Um, Jeroboam, Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who did, ended up doing really wickedly, but he became the king of the nation of Israel. And then on and on as you read through the book of like uh, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and you start reading, you, you go back and forth between the, um, the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. And here we are, we're in Judah, and we're, we're reading here about the story of this guy Joash, who was anointed to be king. He became king, so he's, he's of the household and lineage of David. And they set him up to be king when he was just seven years old. And this is kind of mind-boggling to me. You think of, I have a daughter right now who's going to be seven in January. So this was really something that, that just struck me as, think about this. Think about living in a land and living in an area where the person who's reigning, the person who's ruling, is seven years old. Yeah. That, that's who's in charge now. Now, we know from history, and we know, in fact, that usually there's, it's not the seven-year-old making all the decisions, right? You have somebody, you have the counselors, you have people kind of saying that this is what we do. But they anointed here Joash at seven years old to be king over the land. That is a pretty big responsibility, obviously. That is something that also takes a lot of preparation. And one of the reasons we read all the backdrop to this story is you see a little bit of what was going on. There was this wicked woman, Athaliah. And Athaliah was the mother of Ahaziah. Ahaziah, and, and I know there's a lot of A names and there's a lot of names that sound real familiar and stuff, so we're going to try to get through this so you understand what's going on here. Ahaziah was the father of Joash. Joash was Ahaziah's son. Ahaziah was killed. He, was, he, he died. And this wicked woman, Athaliah, his own mother, this is Ahaziah's mother, when he dies, she wants the kingdom for herself. So instead of the king, you know, the, the, the next king being one of the sons of Ahaziah, because he had many children, she was, it says here in, in 2 Chronicles 22, where we first started, in verse 10, it says, But when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal of the house of Judah. So she went and basically killed anybody who would have a rightful claim to the throne. She killed, I mean, that's her own grandchildren. Yeah, well, I mean, imagine the wickedness of such a woman to go and, 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 and have the wherewithal to be able to kill your own grandchildren. But that's how, how evil and wicked she was. It says, but when Jehoshaphat, the daughter of the king, so one, and obviously she didn't have to kill the daughters because they weren't going, they weren't going to be seen as being king. You know, they weren't going to be in charge. But one of the daughters of the kings sees what's going on and she decides to hide Joash. 
So she takes Joash and, and kind of hides him away so she doesn't realize that Joash is there. He's around. I don't know how she didn't know that he was alive or whatever, but he was a newborn. I mean, he, was, he was just a baby at this time. And, um, you know, a lot of the kings had multiple wives and stuff too. So there might have been a child that she just didn't even know about, which is probably what happened here. And that the daughter took him as if it was her son to raise him. But that daughter, Je Jehoshabeth, was married to Jehoiada, and Jehoiada was a priest. And Jehoiada was a godly man. He was, he was a, a righteous man. So now you have Jehoiada and Jehoshabeth raising up Joash and hid from Athaliah, from that wicked woman who had ended up taking over the kingdom then and began to rule and reign herself over the kingdom of Judah and hid him. And it says in verse 12, and he was with them hid in the house of God six years and Athaliah reigned over the land. Now, the subject matter of my sermon tonight is the title is called Raising a King. They knew, I mean, he was the only heir left. He was the rightful heir. People at this time, they knew what God had promised unto David. They knew that the household and lineage of David was, was prophesied, that, you know, that Jesus Christ ultimately was going to come of that line, but that they were the rightful heirs to that throne in Judah, and that there needed to be someone of his lineage in charge and as a king in that land. And they knew, Jehoiada knew this, Jehoiada knew that, hey, this is the last, I mean, this is, this is the last heir. He's the only one that's able to take this. So they knew from that young age they had to teach him and train him to be a king. They knew that that was his job. And, and, and he had that in mind the whole time because what he did was they took the baby. They, they made sure Athaliah didn't know about it. And then he set up a, a, a guard around the house of God. They, he raised them in the house of God. He raised them basically in church. He raised them with people that were willing to defend him, the people that cared about the lineage of the house of David and that were good godly men. And, they, and you know, he prepared them with bucklers. He prepared them with defense. And he had a whole plan of saying, okay, there's going to be a third of us on watch. There's going to be a third of us out here. You know, and, 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 he, and, he, and he made this plan so that they would rotate through and that nobody was allowed into the house of God or else they're going to be killed. And he said, you know, like where... where Joash was to make sure that they could continue to raise him so until he's old enough to where he could actually take the throne to where, you know, because you're not going to put an infant up there, a two year old, a three year old, a four, you know, they had to get it. And they said, OK, well, we could finally do this at seven to put him on the throne to begin to begin to reign. Now, I just I think about that and I think about, you know, a lot of people have children and they struggle just to get by and they don't really give very much thought or very much effort into raising their own children and into how they're going to teach them and how they're going to train them. Here we have Joash. They had a very clear picture of what they needed him to be, what they wanted him to be, who he was, how important Joash was going to be, how he was going to reign as the king. And that wicked Athaliah then was going to have to be put to death and, and things were going to be restored back to a good and godly manner and to someone who was going to obey the word of the Lord. And this was the task that Jehoiada had in front of him. Here's a newborn baby. I need to get him taught. I need to get him trained. I don't know how much time I have. I have to just make sure that I can prepare him to be a king. And the application I want to be able to make and keep this in mind is that we all have, you know, at least anyone who has children, not, we don't all have children, anyone who has his children, how do you, important do you consider that job to be? There's a lot of people being raised and brought up in this generation who amount to nothing because their parents never thought they were going to amount to anything because they never put the time and invested in them and had a vision for their own child of how are they going to grow up? How important is this person? Are they just another person who's like, oh, well, whatever. Whatever I can get to is what I'm going to get to. Or are you going to be diligent about it and instruct and teach and say, this, is, this person's important. From birth, as, as a little baby, this child is important. Well, I'll tell you what, Joash isn't any more important than your children are. He's not. You can say, oh, yeah, but he had this job to fill. Yeah, he did, but we all have a job to fill. And God's got a job for every single one of us, and we are all extremely important in his eyes, and our children ought to be important in your eyes. Your own children ought to be someone that you can look at and say, this is worth an investment. This is something that I need to make sure that I do right. 
Joash or, or Jehoiada did the very thing with Joash. And he tried his best to raise him. And he had to get him capable and ready to be a king by the time he was seven years old. What a task. I mean, think about how your perspective is going to change. See, he already had his mind. Hey, this guy's got to be king. I got to get him ready. So a lot of his approach is going to be different. He's not just going to, you know, he's, he's going to make sure that he's teaching him wisdom and truth and justice and, and the things that are really important for him to be able to reign. But just because he's going to be king really shouldn't make that any different for a parent to raise their child. The, Pro the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The training and the teaching that you give to your young children when they're young goes, can, will last them for the rest of their life. If you do it right, the Bible says, if you train up a child in the way he should go, and look, that requires work, training. I think about that word training. How are you training your child? Is, is, is your child just a burden to you or do you have a vision for your child? Do you just see them being mediocre and just fitting in society somewhere, having some lame job and just, just living and working and dying and whatever? Is that how you view your child's future? Or do you see them being something more? Do you have a great vision? Are you training them? And that, that word training is key. I remember back in, when I was into a lot of sports and stuff in high school, we did training. And you wouldn't call it training. If, if, you know, when you went to PE, when I went to gym class, that wasn't training. That was kind of just screwing around and having fun, play a game of basketball, play a game of whatever, play a game of football, you know, and it was just kind of fun. And we got a little bit of physical activity. In no sense of the word are you going to say we were training during PE, right? That was just kind of, kind of having some fun, playing some games. When I was in sports, if we were training, you knew when you were training. Because oftentimes, we'd get up in the morning, get up before school starts, get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and go and work out. And then after school, we're working out again. Why? Because we were training. Why? Because we had a vision. Why? Because we had a goal set up that by this point, in this many months, I need to get at this point in my ability to be able to be the best I can, you know, to, to get first place, to achieve whatever it is. That achieve. You do a lot of training. Training is a lot of hard work. It's a lot of sacrifice. When I was in sports, you had to sacrifice doing other things after school because, no, I got to practice. No, I got to practice. No, I got to practice. You even watch what you would eat to make sure that you would be in the best physical shape that you can be in in order to achieve your goal. It requires a lot of training. So when you train up a child, guess what? It's going to take a lot of sacrifice to train a child. You're not just leaving them to their own devices. You're not plopping them down. See, these days, now you have the internet. Say, oh, well, I'm just going to let the internet teach my child. Oh, I'm going to drop off at school. Let them teach my child. No, if you're going to train up your child, you need to train them up. You need to invest the time in them to make sure that they are going to be taught the proper way that they should go so that when they're old, they won't depart from it. It is a time investment. And guess what? That time investment requires sacrifice. When you decide to train up a child, you could, you're going to have to say, what's more important, teaching and training my children when they're at that proper age, when they're at that young age? Is that more important? Or, well, there's this fun event coming up and I want to go here. Oh, and there's this other event coming up here. Oh, and there's other vacation going on over here. And I just want to go and do all these fun things. I want to go camping. I want to do this. And I want to do that. Yeah, you want to do that. But what's more important to you? Are you willing to make sacrifices? Are you willing to say the teaching and training of my children is so important because I want to teach and train a king. I want to teach and train somebody who's going to be somebody who has, a, you know, I have a vision for them. They're going to be a great godly person and one day they're going to do way more things than I've ever done and they're going to be a much better, you know, much better Christian. Someone who's able to do a lot more work for God than I ever even thought possible. It's all going to start by teaching and training from a young age. Turn if you would to Proverbs 29. <clears throat> Proverbs 29, verse 17. Bob reads, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Look at verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. <coughs> Proverbs is explaining there. Look, when there's no vision, the people just perish. They die. You have no direction. You have no goal. There's no end point. You're just going to end up wasting your life. It's going to be vanity and doing nothing. And the people are just going to die. You need to have a vision. 
We need to have a vision for our children. We need to be able to see into the future for them and say, what type of person am I going to raise? I look at my daughters. Do I want my daughters to be like, the, you know, when they, when in 10 years, to be looking like, like the daughters that I see running around in the, in the super short shorts and the, in the low cut tops and the, you know, just looking, looking like a whore? Now, you might find the, the sweetest girl out there, but when, they, when they're dressed and looking like a whore, what does that say to everyone else? And how are they going to be treated by, by the world? They're not going to be treated well at all. They're not going to be respected. I know that much. I don't want my daughters to turn out like that. I want my daughters also to have wisdom. I don't want my daughters just to fall for some jerk who's not going to be able to, to, to provide for them, who's not going to be able to look after them, who's not going to be looking out for their best interest. You know, I want them to be able to know in what they need to be looking out for. I want my daughters to have skills, to have life skills. I want them to be able to grow up and know how to raise their children. I want them to grow up and know how to do things and be able to take care of themselves and, and be able to take care of their families if they have one. These things are all extremely important. I don't want them to grow up having never had the opportunity and never learned these things and just be left off on their own at that point and say, well, now you're on your own. Good luck. No, there's going to be a lot of hard work involved. I want them to know about their diet. I want to know about you know, making food, growing food, cultivating, you know, just the way things work, to have that knowledge and to have that head start. And most importantly, I want them to know about God. I want them to know about serving the Lord. I want them to know all the attributes of God. I want them to know all of the righteous things that they ought to be doing and, and the way that they ought to be living in this lifetime to help them out to grow so that they're not falling under, excuse me, the judgment of God and living a miserable life because they have a stiff neck and they don't want to listen to what God has to say in their life. Turn, if you would, to... Um, well, you're in Proverbs. Just stay in Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs 31. Because the reality is, you know, we saw Joash. They say, oh, yeah, but they knew he was going to be a king. Well, we are actually made to be kings. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God has made us to be kings. God has made us to be, to be priests through the blood of Jesus Christ. When he saved us, he's made us to be kings. We have that responsibility. We have that role through Christ. And it's an awesome role. I mean, think about that. He has made, in Revelation 1, 6, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. So when you look at your child, hey, God has made you to be a king. When you get saved, God's made you to be, to be a rule. You know, when the Bible says that when Christ comes back, you know, we're going to rule and reign with him for the thousand years on this earth. Yes, we will be kings. He is going to be the king of kings and lord of lords, but there will be other kings set up. There will be other rulers and governors set up to rule the land on earth for a thousand years. Raise your child as one of those kings. Have that vision. Equip them from a young age with the skills they're going to need to know. Look at Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, verse 1. The words of King Lemuel. So this is wisdom from a king, King Lemuel. But look at what it says next. The prophecy that his mother taught him. Here we see a king. Here we see a king that is... That is Using God's word that, that is, is here, you know, God has, has used King Lemuel and his mother to promote his own word, to, to give us God's word. Lemuel's mother taught him this prophecy that is God's word, that is found written in the Bible. Whether or not she even knew it at the time as being God's word, she probably didn't. But these words are written down as scripture, as the word of God for us. The mother teaching the king. Verse 2. What my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows? Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. 
Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. So here we see some of the teaching that's being taught unto Lemuel as a son, right, as a child being brought up. And Lemuel now is, is passing this along in the Proverbs, saying, Look, it's not for kings, O Lemuel, to go drink, to have anything to do with alcohol, drinking alcohol. And people say, oh, no, it's okay to drink alcohol as long as you drink in moderation. Look, if you're raising your child and you're raising them to be a king, the Bible says it's not for kings to drink alcohol. Amen. It's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Look, and, and that's why, you know, it, it uses this. And people, I cannot believe when people turn to this as a justification for, out, for drinking alcohol. When the Bible says, give strong drink unto them that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy heart. So you say, oh yeah, well I'm really sad and depressed, so it's okay for me to drink because the Bible says so. Can you not understand the language being used there? I mean, you say, look, it's not for you because you're a king. You know what? Give the booze to the person that, that, that's got nothing going for you, know, that's down and out in the gutter, the, the bum on the street. You know what? Let them drink, but it's not for you to drink. That's what's being said here. It's not, it's not a, um, saying, oh, it's okay to go and drink. He's saying, you know what? If you're going to be anything with yourself, if you're going to make anything out of your life, don't have anything to do with alcohol. Don't drink at all. Stay away from it. Don't touch it. That's why it says in Proverbs 23, Look not thou on the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, and on and on. How it stings like an adder, and, and, it's, gonna, and it's poison, and it's not something you do. But we'll, we're going to get into that in the Proverbs series. series. But these are the types of teachings that we need to be teaching our children. Look, stay away from the pitfalls. Stay, don't have anything to do with alcohol. It's not for kings to be drinking. Stay away from it. And, and you know what? Well, I've got a vision for you. You're going to be someone important. Stay away from this nonsense. Stay away from this junk. It's going to have nothing to do. Um, it's not going to do any good for you. And besides, when people drink, the, the other thing it brings up here is that unless they drink and forget the law, because that's what's going to happen is you, you, you start indulging in alcohol, you're going to forget about your, your judgment skills go way down about what's right and what's wrong and the things that people normally would never be doing once they get some alcohol in them, all of a sudden now they're, they're, they're loose and, and willing to do all kinds of wickedness and sins that they never would have done had they not been drinking. Yeah. It always leads people into doing stupid things, saying stupid things, and thinking and uttering perverse thoughts in their heart and looking at strange women. I mean, that's what the Bible says that it does. And that's the truth. You pervert the judgment. And then in verse number, um, number 8, the Bible says, Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Basically, look out for the, for the little people. Look out for the people who are in need. Look out for the people who are poor. Look out for the people that don't have a voice for themselves. That's who you need to be looking out for. And when you're, when you're raising a righteous individual, someone who says, you know what, you're going to be a king one day. You need to be able to look out for these people and look out for their interests and make sure they're not just trampled and forgotten because God cares about those people. Amen. And you need to be looking for them too. And we need to be teaching our children not to get caught up in the... Um, the cliques and the, and, the, and the people, you know, the, the popularism and, and, what, and just worrying about people liking you and, and being this politician. Because if you're going to raise a righteous king, you can't be a politician. Because right. the politicians just want to please whoever is the person is putting money in their pocket or, you know, taking the bribes or want to please everybody and not doing good for anybody. You need to have the right principles and have the right uh, truth and wisdom in order to be able to judge righteously and, and do just that righteously, what's right. Because that's what matters is what's right. It's not how is this going to benefit me. It's not how am I going to look in the eyes of the people. It's just what is right and what is wrong. We need to make sure that our children are taught what is right and what is wrong. And the only way you could do that is from God's Word. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's the fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter number 6. If 
If you want to raise a king, not only do you have to teach your children, you have to teach your children diligently. Look at verse number 4 of Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. This is the great commandment, right? This is the first great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's quoted by Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Look at verse number 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. The importance of God's word and teaching God's word diligently to your children. I mean, diligent means you are making sure that this happens. If you're going to be diligent about teaching your children the things of God, you know what you're going to do? You're going to wake up in the morning and say, you know what? Before I do anything else, I'm going to make sure that my kids learn about the ways of God, learn from God's word, that this is a priority, that other things might just have to go out the window today, but this is important. This is more important than my daily food. I'm going to make sure that this gets done. That is being diligent about something. I mean, it could be anything. If you're diligent about getting anything done, you have that as your focus. That is the thing that you're going to make sure gets done. And what the Bible is saying we ought to be diligent about is teaching our children. And the way that you're diligent about it is here, they're saying, look, Talk about it when you're sitting in the house, when you're at home. Hey, bring up God's word. Teach them. Talk about it. When you're walking by the way, when you're just out on the street. Hey, we're, when we're out in the car, when we're driving somewhere, talk about it. When you lie down, when you're getting ready to go to bed, talk about it. When you rise up, when you wake up in the morning, talk about it and teach it then. That's being diligent. That's saying, I am going to make sure that my children know that they have this wisdom, that they have this knowledge. And you have to be doing this day in, day out. I guarantee you Jehoiada was doing that with Joash when he was trying to raise a king to be a king at seven years old. He needed to get all kinds of wisdom and truth as much as he could crammed into that little, little mind by the time he was seven to, to have any type of standing as a king. It's also why it's so important to find a godly wife. The Bible says in Proverbs 31, where we were in verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. Finding the right woman to marry, finding the right woman to be the, the, the um, mother of your children is extremely important. And ladies, you know, if you're already married, be that virtuous woman. Be the one that's going, because honestly, the, the women have much more, a much larger role in the teaching and training of the children because God's role has been given to the man to be working and to providing for the family while the woman is a keeper at home and willing and, and, and there to, to raise the children and, and keep the house in order. And the virtuous woman is going to be diligent about teaching her children. Now, I'm not saying the father has no role in this because, of course, the father does. Ultimately, as the head of the household, dad's in charge of the whole thing, of making sure that everything gets done. The buck stops with dad. You've got to make sure that it all gets done. But a godly wife is going to be a major help and is going to be relieve some of that, that, you know, that, that um, responsibility or, or the, yeah, the responsibility of making sure that the children are taught if you have a godly wife. And that's why her, her, she's so valuable. So when your wife is going to have this big of an influence on how the children are taught, you know, single men, don't just be looking for the outward beauty. Don't just be looking for the most attractive woman that you could find because the outward beauty is not going to raise kings right. at all. If you're looking for someone to be a mother of your children, look for someone who has the inner beauty. Look for someone who has, and you know, hey, if they're outwardly beauty, great. I'm not saying don't be attracted to, you know, find someone you're not attracted to, but, but don't be looking for this, you know, supermodel, whatever, you know, whatever you have in your mind is just, this is what, I'm, what I think is important is just this outward beauty because it's not important. The beauty fades away. It vanishes. It's going to be gone and it's going to be nothing. If you marry someone who's just outwardly has the most physically attractive look to you that you've ever seen in your life but has no clue about anything, no clue about the Bible, no clue about God, is that really who you want to leave at home then? Raising your children, teaching them how to grow up and be successful and be, and be good children of God? I mean, that's not who I would want. 
Turn it back, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 21. Because Joash was basically raised by his sister and her husband. That's who it was. His own sister and his sister's husband, so his brother-in-law, Jehoiada the priest. Jehoiada was definitely the positive influence on his life. He made the right choices. The Bible says that Joash made all the right He did the right thing. He did right in the eyes of the Lord as long as Jehoiada was alive. So as long as he had him to rely on. And I'm not going to go into all the reasons and the problems that Joash had after Jehoiada died because that's kind of a whole separate subject. But um, the problems in that family actually started with Jehoshaphat. And this is really interesting because Jehoshaphat, the Bible says Jehoshaphat was, was a good king. I mean, he was a godly man. He did a lot of things that were right and pleasing in the sight of the Lord. He, 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 he followed God and got the people to follow God, and his heart was right with God, and he did so many right things. But the major mistake that he made was he married into the family of the wicked king of Israel, Ahab's family. He married one of the daughters of Ahab. Ahab was a, you know, was one of the extremely wicked king of Israel. And Jehoshaphat made an, a very, very poor choice in marrying one of the daughters of Ahab. Because the Bible says that when he joined affinity with Ahab, that means he became, you know, son-in-law to Ahab and, and, and became related to him through marriage. You're in 2 Chronicles 21. Look at verse number 3. The Bible reads in verse number 3, And their father gave them great gifts of silver and of gold and of precious things with fenced cities in Judah. But the kingdom gave he to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. Now when Jehoram was risen up to the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and slew all his brethren with the sword. And divers also of the princes of Israel. Jehoram was 30 and 2 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 8 years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, like as did the house of Ahab, for he had the daughter of Ahab to wife, and he wrought that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, who we're reading about there, uh, Jehoram was the son of Jehoshaphat. So Jehoshaphat's own son, and, and if you didn't catch that, I'll spell it out for you. Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoshaphat, the righteous king, the godly king that did so many good things for God, but married the wrong woman. His own son, his firstborn son that received the, the right of the kingship, ended up killing all of his brethren. Anyone else who might have possibly, again, had any type of access or right to the throne, he says, they're all gone. Even though he was already anointed king, I mean, he was given the kingdom, and it was clear and it was obvious that, you know what, I mean, look, King David had many sons, but when, so when it was determined that Solomon was going to be king, you know, he appointed Solomon, and then was, the proclamation was made, Solomon was king, and that settled that matter, Right? It wasn't good enough for Jehoram. He went up and wickedly killed, I mean, killed your own brother. I mean, think about killing your own brother. How wicked, again, do you have to be? And where did that wickedness come from? It didn't come from Jehoshaphat. It came from mom. It came from mom and his wife. Because it says here in verse 16, it says, And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, like as did the house of Ahab. Because Ahab was wicked. The kings of, of Israel were wicked. And now he's following in their footsteps. It says, for he had the daughter of Ahab to wife. So he also married into Ahab's family. And he wrought that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now why would he think it's okay to marry into the house of Ahab into that wicked family? Well, dad did it. Right? Here's dad. He married it. It must be fine for me to do the same thing. Instead of holding the right standard. And he turned out to be extremely wicked. <clears throat> now when he died, Jehoram, his son was Ahaziah. And that's who we started off reading about. Ahaziah reigned. And Ahaziah's mother was Athaliah. And it says here, Athaliah was the daughter of Amri. And Amri was Ahab's father. And oftentimes when they'll say, 
you know, the daughter of Amri, it really could be the daughter of Ahab also. It's just they went up an, another level in, their, in the genealogy. But it's still the same wicked family that, uh, that Athaliah was from. And Athaliah is the one who killed all her grandchildren. And that's what we saw in 2 Chronicles 22, verse number 1. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah his youngest son king in his stead. For the band of men that came with the Arabians to the camp had slain all the eldest. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Forty and two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. And he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Athaliah, the daughter of Amri. And Ahaziah did wickedly as his own mother had taught him. I mean, she was wicked herself. It's surprising she didn't even kill her own son when she killed all of her grandchildren too. But so in verse 3 it says, He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counselor to do wicked, to do wickedly. Athaliah was extremely wicked. She, she went, we went over this, how she killed all the seed royal and um, anyone else who would have had right to the throne. And this is where then the cycle of this, you know, these wicked people finally like stops. There's, there's, there's some form of an end put into this because it's just one after the other after the other. You know, they just keep on doing, you know, the one's killing his own brothers and then, you know, the other one's got his mom killing, killing his own children. And um, you can see the importance here, though, by, by going through this and seeing the impact that the wives had and that the mothers had of the importance of finding the right wife. Finding the right woman to be the mother of your children and how extremely important and how much you need to have that in mind if you're looking to get married that, that you need to have when finding someone. Find a righteous lady, uh, you know, uh, someone whose price is far above rubies, someone who's a virtuous woman. And, you know, the rest of Proverbs 31 will tell you what a virtuous woman looks like all the attributes that you ought to be looking for in a wife. And ladies that aren't married, that's the attributes that you ought to be striving for. And those are the attributes that I'm going to be teaching my daughters to be, to be the virtuous women, to, uh, to be the best uh, Christians, the best people that they can be on this earth. Now, um, maybe, exactly, set apart, sanctified, set apart from this world. And, that, and, and you know what? That is extremely important. That, you know, the, a righteous Christian ought to be set apart. One, we ought to be set apart from the world. We ought not to be involved in all the sins and everything else. There ought to be a noticeable difference. But as Christians also, you know, treat your children importantly. Treat them as, as a very important thing that, that they need to be set apart to and teach them and train them the right way so that they're not just taught by the world and just learn all the garbage that this world has to teach them. Now, maybe you're not married. Maybe you don't have any children, okay? And you're thinking, well, you know, how does this sermon really apply to me? You can still apply these principles. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Because I do want these, these principles to still be able to apply to you. I mean, it's, it's, it's always important to have this understanding and have this knowledge. And to know that, yes, of course, our children are important. We ought to be treating them as future kings. As people who are very important. As people who we need to invest time in. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. I just want to point this out because what we're doing when we view our children as, as being future kings is we have a vision for them. You know, remember we, we read the verse earlier where, the, where, where there is no vision that people perish. You can have a vision for someone who's not physically your son. You can have a vision for a person. Look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible reads, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, the apostle Paul wasn't married. The apostle Paul didn't have any physical children. But you know what the apostle Paul had? He had spiritual children. He had people that he had led to Christ himself. And he calls them his own son in the faith unto Timothy. And who, what's he doing? He's mentoring Timothy. He's guiding Timothy. He's writing epistles to Timothy and saying, Look, Timothy, you've got an important job to do. And he knew that Timothy was going to be one day a very great man of God. And he started teaching him and writing to him and training him all that he knew and took upon him that desire. And he had a vision for Timothy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 
You could, you could turn there if you like. Turn, the last place we're going to turn, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse number 15. See, a lot of people don't like when we say, oh, I got someone saved today, or I got someone saved last week, or whatever. It's completely scriptural to say things like that. Now, we all know that without Jesus Christ, we're nothing. Right. We all know that the power of the gospel, the power of salvation comes through Jesus Christ. We know that. And, and we're not taking anything away from Jesus Christ, His authority, His power, or anything when we use this language. Because if we did, then the Apostle Paul wouldn't be using it. It wouldn't be written down in Scripture as saying, you know, you know when we're born again, of course we're children of God. We're begotten by God's seed, by God's Word. But there is an aspect of the person who's doing the soul winning, the physical human instrument, the, the person that's preaching God's word, also being a father to that person. Because like the Apostle Paul said, Timothy, you're my own son in the faith. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, it's spelled out even more clearly than that. 1 Corinthians 4, 15, For though ye have 10,000 instructors, in Christ. There's a lot of people that are teachers. You have all kinds of people in Christ that can teach you. Look what he says here. Yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. He's saying, look, there's a lot of teachers out there. There's a lot of instructors. Learn what you can from them. But look, you don't have very many fathers. You got one father. He says, I have begotten you through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm the one who led you to Christ. I'm the one who, who loved you and, and, and preached the gospel unto you and got you saved, pulling you out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh, as it says in Jude. He says, I beseech you for this fact, because I have begotten you and you don't have many fathers. He says, be followers of me. Look, I'm the one who took the time. I'm the one who went out there. Follow me. He says, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. The Apostle Paul was not doing anything incorrect or wrong in these statements. He still was always saying, you know, that, that he's his own son in the faith because of, you know, through Jesus Christ. He was saying that he's begotten you with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, it's, that, it's, that Christ still gets the preeminence. And he's saying, follow me. And he's saying because that he teaches everyone. He says, he's going to bring you in remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ. So the ways that Paul had that he was doing that were godly, that were, that were following Christ. He says, as I teach everywhere in every church. He wanted them to follow him, but the only reason he wanted them to follow him is because he was following Christ. He's saying, this is the example. I'm being a good example for you, and I want you to follow me. And any good father ought to be a good, you know, want their, their son to follow in their steps. I want my son to follow in my footsteps. I want him to be able to see. I want to say, hey, look, son, there's a lot of people you can learn from. There's a lot of people that could be your teachers. There's a lot of things you could gain in this world, but you only have one father. You know, physically speaking, I'm your father, Johnny. You know, watch me. I'm going to be your example. Learn from me and do as I do, as I follow Christ. And I will, can, I will maintain that, that condition, you know, as I follow Christ, as I do what's right, because that's ultimately what's most important. But I know what thing, I have wisdom. I know what things God wants me to be doing. I'm not perfect at it, but I know enough to know the, the areas where I am doing what's right. And I could say, follow me here as, I, as I'm going out knocking on doors, as I'm going out and sowing, as I'm preaching the gospel, as I'm going out and doing these different things and praying and reading the Bible and memorizing the Bible and doing all these different works. Look to me and do that too. Because that's what God wants you to do. Be that example. We can have a vision for other people that are not our physical children. And we ought to be doing this. It's called discipleship. It's called when you go out and, and help to, uh, to complete the Great Commission and fulfill that by preaching the gospel to every creature, well, the Great Commission isn't just getting them saved. It's also teaching them. You become their spiritual father. You become their spiritual parent. And you ought to treat them as such. You ought to treat them like a newborn babe in Christ because that's what they are once they get saved. When they receive Christ, they become a newborn babe. 
They've just been born again. They need to learn. They need some wisdom. And look, it's your responsibility to help them along. Now, if they refuse and they don't want to have anything to do with you, there's not much you can do about that. But you still can have a vision. You know, I have a vision for people all the time. When we run out the door, I say, man, we just had this kid saved today. And he's young, like he's in his teenagers. And I'm looking at this like, man, you know, if I would have just gotten saved, you know, this kid could do some great things. But he needs to grow. He needs some encouragement. He needs to learn. Everybody that gets saved, they, they need that. And we need to take it upon ourselves to have the vision. You know, don't look at someone. And, and I've, I used to be gu very guilty of this. And even, even today, you know, there's probably some times where I, say, I can't think of one recently. But when I was newer to soul and newer to, to, to doing a lot of stuff, I would go out and I'd see someone I'd be like, there's no way this guy is going to want to have anything to do with me. Because you look at the outward appearance, right? You see someone that's full of tattoos. You see someone smoking a cigarette and they're giving you like mean looks or something. There's no way this guy's going to want to even have anything to do with me. And you know what some people will do? They'll just not even talk to them at all because they think in their own mind that this person's going to have nothing to do with them when you don't know what's going on in their heart. They have this image on the outside. It doesn't mean that you, they won't listen to you, especially when you're using God's word. And I've had people, it's just like, there's no way. And then all of a sudden, what happens? The guy ends up getting saved. They listen. They want, they've just been waiting to hear it. There's all these things that happen in their life. And they're like, man, I'm just ready. You know, they're, they're ready to hear God's word preached and to receive Christ as their Savior. And you don't know that, first of all, unless you open up your mouth and, and, and just do it anyways, whether or not you think that their person's going to get saved based on the way they look. You do it. But also, you can't just stop there. You need to have a vision for them. Just because they might look a certain way, just say, who cares? You know, God still probably has a lot of the great things. You know, this person could still be a great preacher. This person could, could do who knows what. I mean, maybe, you know, whatever. Whatever it may be. What God could have planned out for that person in their life from that moment of getting saved, who cares what they look like? God could change anybody, and we ought not to be looking at the outward appearance. Let's have a vision. Let's not be stuck into thinking, oh, well, that person's got a lot of tattoos. I don't know what they could ever do for Christ. Who's ever want to listen to them? Well, I know a lot of people that have a lot of tattoos, and that's just some kind of silly example maybe, but I know a lot of people that have a lot of tattoos that are doing all kinds of great things for God right now and have dedicated their lives to serving God and, and are doing awesome things. But if you don't have the vision for that person, you might just give up on them. And just, and just leave the, the newborn babe out to, to, to waste. We need to be taking that personal responsibility. And that's why we have those cards in the back. When we go out soul winning, we get new believer cards. And this is what I want everybody doing. When you participate in the soul winning at this church, when you get somebody saved, now there's obviously some instances where, where you know, when they're younger and it's just really not going to make that much sense for a grown adult man to be contacting like a 12-year-old or something you know, <laughs> and, and, and spending a lot of time. There, there's, some, there's some situations where, where it's just not going to make much sense um, to, to be doing all this extra follow-up with. But I want everybody to be doing this. And, you know, you could use your discernment on that. You know what I'm talking about. There's, there's times where um, it's appropriate. But if, there's, if you have an adult, if you have someone that's, that's whatever age, if they're an adult, there's no reason not to follow up with them. Unless they don't want you to, okay? If they don't want you to, if they want, you know, okay. Again, nothing to do with that. But we ought to be taking the personal initiative and responsibility to care about that. You, know, you cared enough to walk up to their door and preach the gospel to them and take the time out of your day to do that. Let's care enough about them then, too, to pray for them during the week. Let's care for them enough, too, to maybe get their phone number or maybe get their address and write them a letter or give them a phone call or do something to encourage them. Do something to help to teach them and to train them. Do something to, 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 to encourage them to come to church and to learn, to get baptized. You know, all of these extra things, when they have somebody personally invested in them, a lot more is going to come from them when if they don't. Just like my children. Is it possible it, for, for my wife and I, for neither one of us to really raise our children all and one of them might turn out really good and do some great things? It's possible. Sure. But what's the likelihood of that? Versus both of us being really involved in making sure that we're teaching and training and getting, you know, the odds <laughs> go way up for their success when we're investing the time and effort into them. We need to be the same way with the people that get saved out at the doors. Invest the time in them.
Because guess what? It'd be? It, it's great to get people saved. Do you know how much better it is to get somebody saved and become a soul winner? Yeah. Do you know how much more the efforts now have just multiplied? And that's the great multiplication of bearing fruit. Not only leading people to Christ, leading them to Christ and then teaching them to lead other people to Christ. That's where the multiplication comes in. And that's where the great works are going to be done and, and, and the great, um, just great works overall for Christ and, and bringing honor and glory unto God. It's going to be that much more and that much better for us. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for your words. And for loving us and caring about us, dear God, and I pray that you would please help us to be diligent to teach our own children in the flesh, that we would be able to, um, to raise them and teach them to become, to become kings, to be, to be great Christians, dear Lord, to teach them truth and equity and to do what's right, dear Lord, and to instill integrity into them, dear Lord, as, as the future generation. Let us all have a vision for our own children to be great and, uh, and to be great workers for you, dear Lord. And I pray also that you would help us to have this, uh, a similar vision for people that we win to Christ out soul winning, that we would not just um, abandon them, but, but work on them and pray for them and, and keep them in our hearts and, uh, and help them to grow also that we can make disciples, dear Lord, and we can teach them and train them in your doctrine. Lord, I pray that you would please help us all to have a fervent spirit that is willing to go out and, and to reach the lost with the gospel, dear Lord, and that you would, you would continue to add people to our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.